always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cena. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cena. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, July 13th, 2023. My name is Emma Vigland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Bradford Vivian, author of Campus Misinformation, The Real Threat to Free Speech in American Higher Education. And later in the show, Marco Fronseca, professor at York University Glendon campus, will be with us to give us an update on the pivotal elections in Guatemala. Meanwhile, Biden met with Zelensky. He stated his belief Ukraine will join NATO eventually he's in helsinki today ftc chair lena khan subject to dozens of hysterical wall street journal op-eds to face questioning today by jim jordan and company because she's been just like too effective at regulating at regulating corporations Gillibrand and the Senate, in the Senate, I should say, Cory Bush in the House, lead efforts to revive the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution, same-sex equality. 1,600 TV and movie actors to strike tomorrow, the first major action since 1960 on this front, joining the writers. A newly unionized workforce at Bluebird, an electric school bus maker in Georgia is facing obstacles from management and negotiations despite the company receiving a billion in EPA subsidies as an incentive. Means we need mandates, not incentives, okay? <laughs> Speaking of the EPA, they are proposing new rules for lead dust in homes and childcare facilities. Senate confirms a 38-year-old civil rights attorney to a federal di district court, Tiffany Cartwright, the third Biden selection under 30. One third of student borrowers spent money they thought was going to be forgiven, thanks Supreme Court. The DOJ says Mississippi is discriminating against black voters with its efforts to stack the city of Jackson with GOP-aligned judges. Heat conditions in the southwest continue to be at dangerous levels. And lastly, in New Delhi, India, access to clean drinking water plummets as massive amounts of flooding have damaged treatment facilities in the country's capital. All this and more on today's majority report. I mean, let alone the historic heat in Greece and spain right some spain of what we're seeing crazy like 130 plus degrees absolutely um totally nuts I, I should have headlined the 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 new defamation lawsuit against fox news but the point is that i wanted to open with it because it's as juicy as it gets um but first hello bradley hello matt it's an M majority so, report thursday it is you thirsty know. thursday i mean oh yeah <laughs> I would love it, maybe. but maybe, maybe, I'm wish maybe not. Maybe I'm wish I already casting. finished my coffee. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, I don't think I could do that no one right knows now what's in, my clean in the heat. <laughs> like if I'm experiencing heat delirium, which I feel like I have been all week, and I'm drunk, that's just like not going to end though. well for for the show. Mm. I'll make sure to stay stay hydrated here. But um, big news yesterday. I guess this broke last night. Fox News being sued once again. They just settled two major lawsuits, the 780-ish uh, million dollar settlement against Dominion for um, all of their irresponsible coverage about the election results in 2020, then the $12 million settlement with the former Tucker Carlson producer who sued for a toxic workplace. They still have the Smartmatic uh, lawsuit out 
pending another voting technology company that they lied about. They're seeking billions of dollars. I'm sure they'll settle for less than that at some point, but that's like a lot of payouts. Plus, now this, okay? So Ray Epps, he was just a standard fascist. <laughs> just kidding. I mean, I don't want to, you know, whatever. But sure. like, uh, sure. Just a standard MAGA do- a nut job, right? Yeah, like he went because he he went because he had concerns about election integrity. Yeah, to the he Capitol. he was at January sixth. Yeah. Yeah, so he was either a uh, yeah fascist or a propagandized idiot. Either way, not a good. But but he did you know speak about how he much he loved Tucker Carlson and Fox News before this. Um, yeah, as I was saying. So he was there on January sixth, and um, somehow. He became the subject of a bunch of conspiracy theories about him being an undercover agent for the government there to instigate violence as a way for, you know, the deep state to take down Trump supporters, because we all know things about the CIA and the FBI and the NSA and the deep state. They they really hate conservatives. Um, That's obviously made up. But it was repeated a bunch of times on Fox News, and we'll play some of those instances for you, particularly on Tucker Carlson's programs. And I think that's, as we kind of pull at this thread, it's becoming a little bit more clear that this, plus the toxic workplace, might have been the impetus to sideline Tucker, force him out, not let him out of his contract so he couldn't be on the air through the presidential election, and protect themselves legally in some way. Maybe they had a sense that this was coming. Um, Ray Epps, as a result of this, had to sell his uh, his ranch in Arizona and his business, according to his lawyer, because he was facing so much harassment. People were selling, uh, like, arrest Ray Epps merch. But this is from NPR. They spoke to his lawyer, and there's some really fascinating quotes in this, and then we'll play some of Tucker's coverage. But according to Epps' attorney, Michael Teeter, Epps and his wife were Fox viewers and Carlson fans whose lives were turned upside down by the network. Epps said he and his wife had to sell their home and give up their wedding business and move to a mobile home in Utah. He believed in Donald Trump, and he believed the lies that Fox told, Teeter says. The fact that the, uh, then Fox would take one of their viewers and turn him into the villain of one of their conspiracy theories demonstrates what we've known for a while, which is Fox News does not care about its viewers. This is the attorney uh, speaking to NPR. Days after the Dominion settlement, Fox stripped Carlson of his primetime show, seeking to sideline him until his current contract ends, uh, which is after the upcoming elections. I mentioned that earlier. According to Chadwick Moore, who has written a biography of Carlson, his show was to focus once more on Epps the evening that he was ousted. I just want to repeat that. He was ousted unceremoniously, right? Right before he was supposed to go on air. And it seems to be the case that he was going to talk about this guy, Ray Epps. Carlson was one of the primary defendants in the Dominion suit, which showed him to be privately attacking the network's reporters for publicly contradicting Trump, even though he, as he acknowledged, they were correct. This final part is also interesting here. Other Fox hosts hosts stoked the emotional fires that fueled the January 2021 protest to a greater degree than Carlson. Yet after the siege, Carlson quickly embraced a series of contradictory conspiracy theories. He argued that the brutal attack was essentially a rally that got a bit rowdy. And he also claimed that the federal government and anti-governmental protesters from Antifa and instigated it. I mean, it's very clear that like the the, and and immediately like on the day I heard people like in like my parents were talking to suggesting this was Antifa. That was in North Dakota. So I heard either through the radio and stuff like that. And, And it's very clear that all of this emphasis, which I think Greenwald's also um, um, played into, is is basically to make a day that it should be a referendum on the extreme right in this country, uh, one about government conspiracy. And, like, the conspiracy to me is, like, uh, like w- how this was allowed to happen so significantly not that like it was completely instigated by the uh by the feds like it's it, which is, well that you know. would be ridiculous i mean it, it, it if anything there was as matt's saying too little 
Uh, t- this was taken way. Uh, they should have prepared as if it was as if it was uh, you know a Black Lives Matter protest, and there would have been way larger barriers. And they stuff should like have that. activated Bill Barr and activated him very strongly. I know he'd resign by that point. Um, I, I, like, partly the, in part because of this kind of crap. Well, and probably I think that like another reason that why there might not have been the response is because a lot of the FBI is actually sympathetic to the. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Epps became a touchstone in re- reconciling those uh, so far baseless theories. Carlson's claims presented on his show and in a three-part series called Patriot Purge on the Fox Nation streaming service led to the resignations of two Fox commentators, Jonah Goldberg and Stephen Hayes. Anchor Brett Baer and then Fox News Sunday host Chris Wallace objected to the top to top network officials. Wallace signed with CNN shortly after. As recently as this March, however, Carlson once more invoked the specter of federal involvement in the attack on the Capitol. Let's let's play that one first. A lot of this was clearly influenced by federal agents or informants. It was OK, Carlson told viewers. This is a part of the clip that we're about to play, right? The March 2022 time. Whatever's on the sound sheet here. Um A lot of this was clearly influenced by federal agents or informants. It was, okay, Carlson told viewers, but I did not want to suggest that it, uh, someone was a federal agent or informant unless I knew for a fact, because you could really get someone in trouble. It's very clear something very strange is going on with Ray Epps, he said. I mean, don't lie to my face. The Ray Epps thing isn't, isn't organic. Sorry. So, like, this is the kind of thing that's opening them up to litigation. Let's play some of this here. Um, I might have the dates wrong. There are just so many instances where Tucker talked about this. So this is a separate one. This is when he had a, a graphic here that says Fed Epps. We'll just play a little bit of what he said. Nor does anyone in authority want to talk about Ray Epps. Ray Epps, of course, is the man who was caught on tape encouraging the crowd outside the Capitol, both on January 5th and 6th, to commit felonies by rushing inside. Now, what's interesting is that the January 6th committee, under public pressure, did in the end interview Ray Epps. Now, we don't have all of the committee's records about that interview. We should, but we don't. But some uh, have been released, and what they tell is a remarkable story. In the testimony that we have, the committee coaches Ray Epps on how to answer questions about his involvement. Quote, I was in the front with a few others. I also orchestrated it. I helped get people there. End quote. Now, Epps admitted that in a text message to a relative on January 6th. He's admitting crimes. No. He's never been even charged for those crimes. But what's so fascinating is that when all right, so you guys can pause it here. You can pause it here. You can see someone on the committee responds this the time. Ray Epp or Fed Epps graphic. There, he's admitting maybe to the crime of potentially trying to overturn the election, not the uh, "I'm a Fed" thing. But this was the most egregious one um, in his daytime thing that he did, where he kind of you know tried out some of the extremists that he might eventually have on his primetime show. This is where. Elijah Schaefer. Oh, Tim Pool guest. Elijah yeah, Schaefer, who Tim... uh, that guy clipped. Yeah, um, it's it's so funny how full, full circle this stuff ecosystem. Comes. Yeah, the the uh, the neo Nazi shooter. This was the ep- uh, the guest that he screenshotted episodes of and, and posted uh, mm-hmm. from Tim Pool show. Also was ousted from the Blaze for being a sexual harasser. Allegedly, yeah. Elijah Schaefer speaking to Tucker Carlson on his program about Ray Epps. And, and this is, like, these quotes, I think, are included in the lawsuit. And because Schaefer is important here, because Schaefer's specifically talking about documentary work he did um, on January 6th at the Capitol, and he said that he saw Epps participating in behavior that made him think he was a federal agent. Well, I mean, he's an expert, right? And experts can make mistakes. Oh, wait. Like, but that is important, right, to the... Uh, how far this lawsuit can go. This isn't somebody who actually is in law enforcement or has knowledge of this kind of stuff. This is a well-known hack and propagandist who spewed this kind of thing, and it's going to just help Epps' case. The entire year of 2020 was BLM and Antifa. It's It's terrifying, and you have to ask why. So why were they so intent on shutting down your reporting and the reporting, the honest reporting of others? So you were happened to be standing very close to a man called Ray Epps, who is a leader of what we're told is a right-wing extremist group. He has not been indicted. 
based on what you saw personally, did Ray Epps seem to be encouraging people to break the law that day? 100%. I, I did not see any violence occurring. I don't think anybody that was at the front lines went with the intent to do anything other than to protest peacefully. There were barriers, but there was one sure. individual who was whispering in people's ears, the very people that instigated the attacks, the ones who pushed the barrier, who are being prosecuted for injuring a Capitol officer, a female who wasn't wearing a helmet, who still has head injuries to this day, I, I found out. They're all being prosecuted, but the man who instigated it, who was, who was starting the violence, for some reason the FBI is no longer interested in him. And I've spoken to prosecutors, I've spoken to defense attorneys, because obviously that's my point. Sorry, just pause it real quick. Um, Elijah Schaefer is a guy who I heard on a Dave Rubin uh, uh, video with some other people who were there on Jan 6, very concerned about their own actions and maybe they were going to investigate. And there's a story here from the desk. Um, mm. uh, a Fed investigate reporter over U.S. Capitol attack tweet. And just for folks who don't remember this tweet, it was breaking. I am inside Nancy's, Nancy Pelosi's office with the thousands of revolutionaries who have stormed the building. <laughs> to put into perspective how quickly staff evacuated, emails are still on the screen alongside a federal alert warning members of the current revolution. Oh, yeah. But they're just, you know, <laughs> everyone was totally peaceful. Uh, this is in 2021, November. Yeah, yeah, right. So, I mean, it, it's, hey, even though you're a documentarian, this is supposedly your job, it, it, it's, I think it's he let easy himself, to forget. He became part of the story a little bit, and uh, we just brush over that. But I, Yeah, we, we got, and, and then here, I mean, it's one thing for a guest to say this kind of stuff, but this is, like, the same through line that we talked about related to Dominion, is that if the employees... One, it, what you, you shouldn't really have guests on to say this stuff if you're not going to push back. But it's incumbent upon the employees to provide at least some cover for the company, Fox News, and, and give at least nominal pushback and put caveats in place to protect them legally. Let's see if Tucker Carlson does that here. Witness, I was there. And if there's anybody that I would pick out as a journalist and say, that's the man who would be key suspect number one, for some reason the federal government says, well... We're just not interested in him. So we have a lot of tape of Ray Epps the night before encouraging people to break the law and to break into the Capitol. And I'm people sorry, clearly like, think that he's a federal I, I, agent. I, I, we, the idea that it was one guy telling all these hogs to do it, like they broke per the perimeter in multiple places. I mean, this is classic, classic uh, CYA stuff for people that do something bad and especially if they have no scruples and they're completely without morals <laughs> and loyalty they're gonna just let one guy take the fall um and and it's just they, the problem is they 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 the the out of control q and honors they got this conspiracy in their heads and now tucker just runs with it without any uh qualms honestly because that's they're they're not committed to the truth they're committed to making money here we go they call them that but with your own eyes, you saw this same man encouraging people to do it. I just want to be totally clear. You saw this yourself. Yeah, I will say this. There was a man on a, on a bullhorn or a megaphone, and he was yelling to people to 1776, the front gate. People were not going along, though. People were kind of like, oh, man, they started saying, you're Antifa, and they started yelling at him. So people were not going along with, with, with acts of violence liar. or encouraging to escalate things. It did not escalate until well, who we now as identified as Ray Epps began whispering in the ears of certain individuals which led immediately after to the instigation oh, of violence. Oh, he's whispering. You're saying this in public, it's on videotape, and this man has not been indicted, and no one in the Justice Department will explain why, and anyone who asks the question is denounced as some sort of conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy theories are starting to sound like spoiler Here's alerts liars. at this point. Um, <laughs> I'm grateful for your original reporting on that day. Elijah Schaefer, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elijah, for covering your ass and uh, throwing a random uh, Trump supporter under the bus because some lunatics in on the internet thought he might be Antifa uh, to save your own ass for your complicity in you and the rest of the revolutionaries storming into yes. Nancy Pelosi's office and potentially screwing over Fox News in the process and Tucker Carlson. Like, this is, you know that meme of the first domino to fall and then that finally uh, the, the big one does. That's Tucker Carlson getting fired from Fox News, potentially, and also uh, Fox News losing. In the, in the total, totality of these lawsuits, I mean, they're already up to around $800 billion just based on the suits that have set, those two that have settled so far. The uh, toxic workplace one 
for Tucker's show and the Dominion one. With Smartmatic and with this coming up, we're going to be well over a billion, potentially into two billion in settlements just from their coverage over the past few years alone and their workplace, which is just like, thank you, Schaefer. I want to know us that. at what point uh, that Elijah Schaefer, who's uh, reporting Tucker Carlson, uh, apparently proves of um, what at what point on that day he went from, oh, that guy looks like an Antifa provocateur trying to lure us all from this peaceful protest we're doing out here into the Capitol, how he went from that uh, suspicion that he still airs on Tucker uh, months later that Tucker lets him do, uh, how he went from that to moments later saying, again, breaking I am inside Nancy Pelosi's office with the thousands of revolutionaries who have stormed the building to put into perspective how quickly staff evacuated emails are still on screen alongside a federal alert warning members of the current revolution. <laughs> Yeah, how did how do you square those two things? You just never bring it up because that's uh, that's the the uh, Tucker Carlson way. All right, guys, quick break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Bradford Vivian. back and we are joined now by uh bradford vivian professor in the department of communications uh arts and sciences at penn state author of campus misinformation the real threat to free speech in american higher education brad uh, thanks so much for coming on today uh thanks for having me i appreciate it so i mean we hear constantly from the right wing that no no one can disagree anymore no one can disagree anymore on college campuses like the the pink-haired pronoun youth are creating this this chilling effect and and there's no more free speech anymore on on university campuses when and how did that narrative really begin to form based on your research into this phenomenon terrific right so there is a story to this and i think for u.s society what i describe as the language of campus misinformation really kicks into high gear around 2017 and that's for very strategic reasons if uh, listeners think of the things they might have been reading in op-eds and clickbait media around that time there were many many stories about speakers on college campuses who had quote unquote conservative views or traditional views who were being protested and shut down and there were mobs quote unquote of coddled undergraduate students irrationally reacting to the mere idea that somebody would express a dissenting viewpoint on college campuses. So the way in which that was reported, this language of describing what's allegedly happening on campuses, which was very scary and frightening and seemed anti-free speech, became popularized around 2017. But what I think was underreported was the fact that this was a strategic reactionary movement that was trying to make relatively free, diverse, pluralistic college campuses where a lot of disagreement and uh, competing viewpoints are tolerated seem very ugly and confrontational and try and drive down public support, particularly for state-funded mm -hmm. higher education. And if you think about what those speakers would have been speaking about, these were conscious efforts to try and antagonize and create some sort of conflict. What was allegedly so controversial on college campuses were not, um, say, talks about biology or ancient archaeology or obscure parts of history, uh, all these sort myriad different academic subjects, but they were always forms of speech that were about antagonizing marginalized groups on college campuses to create very intentionally a spectacle, a confrontation uh, for a bunch of pro provocateurs and, and for the most part propagandists to market themselves that way. And this yeah. has become unfortunately sort of legitimized with a lot of pop psychology. 
Well, it's a cottage industry, too. I mean, I'm just thinking about just a few off the top of my head of these grifters that have uh, made a ton of money off of this kind of thing. Brett Weinstein was, you know, left college because he couldn't say what he wanted to say about, uh, what was it? Bi he's a biologist. The day of absence and stuff like that. Oh, Brett yeah. Weinstein. It's yeah. It's nonsense. I mean, but now he's has his... Uh, COVID misinformation podcast, he's cashed in. Charlie Kirk is, his whole thing with Turning Point USA is going to colleges thick and hear a diversity of viewpoint and it, it hasn't been effective, but it's made a lot of people wealthy. I mean, for, for your money, like what is, who are some of the, the most egregious actors in this space uh, currently kind of propagating this myth? Right, well, it falls into what I would describe as a few groups. And I think, right, there's definitely um, a sort of easily described grifter group like you're describing. Um, it, the, the number of organizations out there, for example, and this is in the interest of free speech, they can do this, but I'm just describing what they do. Turning Point USA, for example, um, YAF, traditionally conservative speakers organizations, they speak on college campuses all the time. It's a very slim minority of incidents where you'll get a protest or some sort of uh, conflict, but they make a lot of money and they gain a lot of political capital by speaking on campus and on those campuses saying they're not allowed to speak on college campuses anymore. So I think we should just be honest about the duplicity uh, of that sort of unconstructive take on what's allegedly happening on campuses. Um, I also think a lot of egregious things are happening when hyperpartisan, as I described them, reactionary legislatures in different states take up these narratives as pretexts for why actually we allegedly have to have tighter state control over higher education. We have to put political litmus tests on to ensure a mandatory pro and con viewpoint is getting taught in every classroom, which is not the way free circulation of ideas should take place. And then finally, there's a lot of outside organizations who their ideas are not part of the normal process of university research and teaching. I'm thinking of groups like Heterodox Academy here um, and books like The Coddling of the American Mind by attorney Greg Lukanoff and uh, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt. And these have a lot of populist centrist appeal it goes a sort of across the board, um, but these are sort of groups and messages that are about criticizing institutions of higher education from outside those institutions to try and create a negative perception of them in public discourse. Can, can you talk a bit more about that dynamic of centrists and kind of liberals buying into uh, this narrative here? I mean, Jonathan Haidt, just had another all-timer in terms of an op-ed that came out yesterday that's being widely panned, but, um, or was that Jonathan Chait? Damn it. Uh, no, never mind. Not uh, Hyde this time, but, but soon enough, I guess. Um, I mean, like, th those kinds of, um, I, I, I witnessed it myself, you know, within people I know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, regurgitating quickly talking points uh, and and you base your chapters on some of these um, phrases like safe spaces or trigger warning that kind of thing very quickly those kinds of people were um, uh, regurgitating the the those those phrases as a part of some sort of free speech crisis um, what's your analysis of that the, the way that that was so quickly absorbed by those people well, this is what I mean in one chapter titled Pseudoscience, uh, by the fact that there's been a lot of appropriation of a quasi-psychological or political scientific vocabulary to allegedly describe what's happening on college campuses. And so, right, in this period I'm describing, kind of from the mid-2010s forward, uh, listeners will probably remember a lot of hyperbolic headlines about trigger warnings and safe spaces on campus. As a university professor, I've got about a quarter of a century in now on several different campuses. I think I've been in a conversation where those phrases have been mentioned maybe once or twice. It's just not part of the ongoing process of being on a university campus in the majority of respects, in my opinion. Uh, but it seemed like there was this psychological crisis where students were so fragile and they could no longer tolerate standing dissenting ideas. 
and were easily quote unquote triggered and so forth. These are actually terms of denigration, but they were marketed to the public as psychological diagnoses, irresponsibly in my opinion. And so I think that's where the centrism comes up, that if you're able to successfully promote to the public at large, I'm not saying this from a political or ideological standpoint, I'm concerned for the psychology and well-being of undergraduate students, um, then it seems like readers and members of the general public will be hearing a legitimate psychological diagnosis. I go into that chapter, however, to say this is based on a lot of uh, misuse of legitimate scientific data or also just manufacturing of very poor quality scientific data. And my concern there is there once we have this sort of code of denigration, which is mistaken for an accurate description of uh, undergraduates and, and the good work that the majority of them do on college campuses, that's pretty corrosive of democracy in general. And if I could say one more thing on sure. the subject, the, the, the sneaky part of this and the really destructive part then is that those terms of denigration are often used to describe uh, marginalized, historically marginalized communities on college campuses. And I think the premise of books, here I'm just describing, not criticizing, I think you'll find this is a pretty dis good description of what Lukanoff and Haidt say, is that if you are a student who belongs to what you think is a social justice movement or a teacher or administrator, uh, and you think you're part of a historically marginalized community, still now in the present, you might be psychologically maladapted. You might need cognitive yeah. behavioral therapy. And this echoes sort of uh, a lot of international rhetoric from authoritarian countries uh, that's targeting, it's not all students, it's students who are LGBTQ and so forth, uh, who represent from marginalized communities. Those are the repeated targets over and over again in increasingly authoritarian countries, university campuses like Hungary, and then now through this kind of um, pseudoscience increasingly in U.S. groups as well. Well, calling it pseudoscience is really important because there is no seeming uh, scientific rigor applied to uh, these claims, nor when these sensational stories about shouting down some sort of speaker from like a liberal group, nor are they really investigated by media members in the way that they should be. It seems like for the most part, the press is reacting to the rights outrage as opposed to investigating the nature of the claims. Like, can you just talk about that snowball effect of uh, uh, the right being very effective at um, coalescing behind a narrative and then that becoming reported as fact and then centrists responding to it like, you know, well, this is something we really got to deal with. <laughs> Right. Well, in terms of um, just a factual historical take, I, in one of my chapters, I say we're sort of dealing with a new version of a historically self-described conservative uh, set of arguments about higher education. So if we think about the modern conservative movement uh, and right-wing politics in the U.S., it's just a fact that it begins in large part with some pretty strident um, polemics against college campuses. And so William F. Buckley, for example, is, is known to have sort of helped to popularize the idea that all college campuses or universities are liberal by nature, politically and socially. And um, conservative talk radio gets started in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. This is something they're talking about all the time. Yeah. And so, can I just say, like, there is some truth to that. I mean, this, the, the, the more knowledge you seek, frankly, the less conservative for the most part you're going to be in these kind of spaces. And I think that's the threat that they perceive. Mm -hmm. They're supposed yeah. to be moderating spaces. And the message there is that it's very tough to control yeah. um, from one just super partisan perspective. Um, so in terms of that feedback cycle, though, I think we're also in an era where uh, in terms of particularly mainstream media, but also readerships, we're dealing with a broader manufactured outrage culture and a lot of prevalent misinformation. And so if we think about um, misinformation campaigns that are shaping our society right now, uh, vaccine misinformation, electoral misinformation, 
uh, misinformation about climate change. I think we can um, consider a lot of people in our lives who wouldn't identify as particularly partisan one way or another, who are at least sympathetic to saying now, well, maybe there's something to be concerned about if people are so sure uh, that vaccines are safe or if they're so sure that there's something like global warming. So you've got a kind of, I think, cyclical um, set of messages in a lot of different media. And there's maybe something, this is me speculating myself a little bit here, but there seems like something appealing, I think, to a lot of people if they came from a university education, they want to think about it with pride and so forth and think about tradition and um, those spaces as conserving, conserving certain legacies. And then when they hear that students are getting active politically, and they have new and different ideas on those campuses, maybe that's a bit of a threat to that sense of prestige and tradition and status quo. Um, so as a result, we get a lot of op-ed writers in particular uh, in, in mainstream media like the New York Times in the late 2010s. Uh, and even now, it's, it's almost as if they set up this beat of manufactured outrage mm. about college campuses that's very distinct from the terrific investigative reporting about higher education that goes on in those outlets. Hey, you mentioned the Times. Another person who cashed in on this panic, Barry Weiss, um, very much so, I would say. The, I, I want to return to uh, the William F. Buckley example that you give, because as with most things in conservatism, what is old is, uh, or what is new is old, and what is old is new again, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they are very, uh, the, the tropes are pretty easy to identify once you kind of uh, cover this as much as, as I do, at least. Um, mm -hmm. And the, 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 the fact that this is kind of a similar exploitation of the cultural anx uh, anxiety that, that he uh, engaged in, um, do you mind just drawing some parallels to campuses during in the 50s and in the 60s at this time and what's happening today? Absolutely. Well, I think a, a lot of the crux of, and I use the word reactionary because I think it's a little bit more specific. And I think um, a lot of self-described conservative politics about college campuses is really what I call reactionary and a pretty standard political science definition there is a movement that wants to say, okay, we've had enough change. We've had mm -hmm. enough expansions of rights and culture has become open enough. Uh, and now we have to start putting limits on that or roll it back. They're reacting to change in a backward looking notion. So I think we're in an era then uh, of what I call ongoing desegregation. We're not in a post segregation era with respect to publicly funded education and even private Ivy League education, a lot of what was going on in Buckley's time, if we think about his idea that college campuses are too liberal, that just doesn't live up to uh, an understanding basically of what college campuses were like at that time. In the 50s, 60s, only until recently, there was a change where college campuses very historically recently in the US used to be primarily reserved for cultural and economic elites, uh, primarily uh, women, uh, people of color were largely systemically barred from those communities, and we can go on down the list. In Buckley's time, college meant more like almost exclusively Ivy League or sort of distinguished state institutions. And so I think, interestingly, the parallel is that we have a lot of messages now about saying, well, college campuses have become too diverse and so forth. When you just start to get those percentages, we're really just within a generation or two where there are significant amounts on many uh, university campuses of people of color, of people openly identifying uh, as being from the LGBTQ community, uh, international student populations. Uh, the irony is then that a lot of these messages are reactionary, as I describe them, because they sound like those things that people like Buckley and, and all kinds of radio hosts and ideologues were saying to resist segregation in the 50s, desegregation, excuse me, in the 50s and 60s. And now we're in an era where we're truly, historically speaking, just starting to get something like a more authentically diverse representative and fact-based for that reason, free speech, all these different people, these communities 
uh, we're approaching something like a more diverse meritocracy and trying to attain it. And that's where I think the reactionary kickback comes from and why it, it seems um, so uh, reminiscent of some of those pro-segregationist ideas from the 50s and 60s to keep yeah. university education exclusive and out of reach for many people. I mean, you can see that in the two Supreme Court decisions that we just saw, <laughs> the overturning of Biden's uh, student debt cancellation and the affirmative action one. We want to keep these universities as uh, institutions of capitalistic reproduction as opposed to ones that are more emancipatory or allow for more diverse opinions and diverse people to like have success um it, it's it's re-stratifying those uh those lines and i mean you talk about this in the context of even the war on education more broadly with the anti-crt stuff um, and I would put don't say gay in there as well. And the mm -hmm. other kind that kind of legislation. Can you can you talk about how rapidly the war on colleges and universities, the free speech stuff trickled into legislation about public education broadly down to, you know, kids in kindergarten and K through 12? Absolutely. It was quite rapid. So as I mentioned, I started being concerned about hearing all these messages about what's allegedly happening on campuses and then it just not resembling uh, the profession as I understood it very much at all. That was in about 2017, 2018, as I mentioned. And when I was revising the book and it was going to press last year, um, I have notes in there about things that were just starting to happen in the Florida legislature under Ron DeSantis. But really we're living, and that's why I say it's sort of an ongoing struggle to fully desegregate campuses. You've had a lot of activity for several years now. There is a crisis of free speech and academic freedom in publicly funded education. And the crisis is not coddled undergraduate students. It's increasing political interference with what should be free, relatively self-governing academic affairs. And so I mentioned in the book for years now, the Goldwater Institute, a hyper-partisan think tank, has been marketing uh, in, in political circles, politically marketing, all kinds of draft legislation that now, not only in Florida, it's also being adopted through numerous state legislatures. And I think it's very important for listeners to understand that, as you mentioned, the K through 12 education, you have these just broad slogans now, the idea that students in K through 12 are being ideologically indoctrinated, there's no teaching going on, or that they're uh, digesting critical race theory or it's being forced upon them or that they're being sexualized by teaching about the full spectrum of gender and sexual diversity and humanity from a fact-based perspective. All these claims were first beta tested about college campuses. So the disturbing thing for democracy as well as K through 12 education is that when you have these anti-university messages, they become a good engine for generating these political pretexts and now we have a historically significant wave of outright state censorship uh, in these state legislatures. My objection to them is not because it's primarily from one political party. My objection to them is because it's anti-democratic, it's anti-academic, uh, it puts a break on basic liberties. And so there you have really a, a crisis now in what, if you look at kind of what a lot of scholars describe as K through 12 education, in addition to higher education, these are some of the most democratic spaces in the country because they're governed by locally elected officials. You can go to your school board, but just like on college campuses, now we have provocateurs and propagandists trying to gum up the works of what's in US culture, one of our relatively speaking more open and self-governing forms of institutional decision-making. Well, um, really appreciate your time today. Bradford Vivian, professor in the Department of Communication, Arts and Sciences at Penn State, author of the book Campus Misinformation, The Real Threat to Free Speech in American Higher Education. I 
uh, we will put a link to uh, the book in the description of the show, wherever you're listening or watching this, and at majority.fm. I'd recommend it as like, you know, my favorite kind of book giving is passive aggressive book giving. Um, and this is a perfect one for anyone in your family that might have um, bought into some of this crap, especially if they're, you know, kind of centrist uh, people. So and it's, it's on my list. Appreciate your time, Brad. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, guys, quick break. And when we come back, uh, we'll be speaking to Marco about uh, what's happening in Guatemala. We are back and we are joined now by Marco Fonseca, professor of international studies at York University Glendon campus in Toronto, here to speak with us about the, uh, the, the, the situation in Guatemala right now after their first round of elections. The second uh, round is, is going to be in late August. Marco, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So uh, general elections happened in Guatemala a few weeks ago, and the results were surprising in a good way for democracy, I, is, is my sense of things from the outside. Could you just give us a quick rundown of the results, what happened um, bare bones here? Yes. Uh, the elections took place on June 25th, um, uh, just 18 days ago, and the results of that day were actually surprising for everybody. Uh, it actually was stunning results. A political party that had been polling, uh, you know, uh, seventh place two months before the elections and with less than 2% of approval uh, uh, ratings just two days before the elections ended up winning second place against all odds. With only 650,000 votes in their favor, that was enough nevertheless to, get to, to, to enable them to place in second place uh, in the elections and then move on to a runoff election on August the 20th. It was a stunning, stunning result, completely unexpected. Nobody, nobody had counted on it. It was a party that had been discounted. It was a small party born out of the 2015 protests in Guatemala. And well, uh, 18 days later, it's the party that's likely to be facing off uh, uh, on August 20th. This party, it's led by somebody whose last name is quite famous in Guatemalan politics. If you could just give us a sense of, of the, where the party stands politically and the rich history involved with its, its candidate leading it. The party is called Semilla. Some people translate it as seed, the seed party, Semilla. It was born out of the 2015 protests in Guatemala City. The protests took place because of the levels of corruption that had actually reached unprecedented levels by that year with the uh, with the government at the time, the government of Otto Perez Molina of the of the of the PP party. Um, Semilla also obviously has deeper roots in Guatemala's history. One of the founding members of the party, Semilla, is Bernardo Arevalo. Bernardo Arevalo is the son of President Juan Jose Arevalo Bermejo, who was the first democratically elected president of Guatemala in the 20th century. He was the president in Guatemala from 1944 to 1950. In other words, that was the first presidency of what is widely known as the Guatemalan Spring, the most democratic moment in Guatemala's political history. And as everybody knows, the Guatemalan Spring eventually ended up being overthrown by a CIA-backed coup in 1954. So the legacy, the political legacy of the Guatemalan revolution, as it is widely known in the country, is huge. It has inspired generations, generations of politicians and social movements and activists all the way to the widespread protests of 2015, 
which are the protests out of which Semilla, this unlikely political party, was born. And Bernardo Arevalo undoubtedly carries on his shoulders the weight of all this incredible history in Guatemala. Now, very few people were counting on Arevalo's incredible performance on June the 25th. But now that he's actually been able to secure this place, the rising expectations are just, frankly, uh, gigantic. And on the flip side of things, so uh, Arevalo has this uh, cachet based on like the historical importance and uh, the, the democracy embedded in that name for so many Guatemalans. On the flip side, what is your sense of how the, the Vamos party, right? That's the ruling uh, uh, party, if I'm not mistaken, or who the, the conservative who's running is is aligned with. Um, like the conservative uh apparatus in general in Guatemala. How connected are these folks to the CIA-backed capitalists from uh, the 50s and on who have been instrumental, instrumental in uh, kind of cutting into democratic procedures within Guatemala and enabling government corruption? Excellent question. I mean, the conservative parties in Guatemala, including the current ruling party called Vamos, as you said, is the party of President Alejandro Giamate. This is one party out of a roster, a cluster of corrupt, extreme right-wing political parties with ties to the long-standing family elites in Guatemala, long-standing anti-communist movements in the country, and also they have ties and connections to the armed forces and to narco trafficking interests. So we're talking about a cluster of corrupt political parties whose, whose roots are to be found way back in the 1954 anti-communist coup d'etat against Arbenz. And since then, they are closely allied and have been closely allied to the military dictatorships that ruled the country from 1954 all the way to 1985 with the support and backing of the United States and obviously the CIA. And when the US couldn't directly support Guatemala's dictatorships in their war against indigenous peoples and revolutionaries and so on, then they did it through Israel. It was a, you know, it was, it was a, it was a kind of a, a, a sort of a detour that was taken by the US given the fact that President Carter uh, effectively suspended military aid to Guatemala. All these political parties have roots in those extreme anti-communist right-wing uh, military and narco-trafficking traditions in the country. But there's one more element that needs to be taken into account. These political parties, including VAMOS, are also political parties that in some ways also look after their own interests. Mm -hmm. And those interests are fundamentally the interests of corruptions, of corruption and corrupt politicians. These guys are in Cahoot. They all have an alliance, which is loosely called in Guatemala the Pact of the Corrupt. All these political parties are there, are, are you know, ha have been in power with one fundamental objective, which is to pursue the enrichment of their own political leaders, their own political elites at the expense of everybody else. In other words, sacking the state, stealing from the state you know, striking questionable deals with all kinds of interests, both national and international, like the o Obre Obedrec uh, construction company. So, uh, you know, uh, so we're talking about political parties with deep-seated interests in maintaining the system of corruption that has been ruling Guatemala for decades, and especially over the last 15 to 20 years. Now, this is what is at stake. It's that system that finds itself under threat and they're mobilizing every resource at their disposal, both inside the state and outside the state, to be able to thwart, to be able to stop this new rising political party that threatens to not necessarily, you know, refound the Guatemalan state, but at least put an end to the regime of corruption. So that was going to be my next question, and thank you so much for that 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 excellent answer. Um, because I'm just curious how this conservative, corrupt 
uh, cabal, essentially, uh, coalition solidified its power over the past few decades and why it's so significant that a, uh, a center-left party, whatever you want to call it on the political spectrum, has broken through into the second round um, and has a chance to make real waves here and break and fracture this, uh, th th this corrupt uh, coalition. That really is what is significant here. But as to the first part of the question, why is it that these political parties have been able to consolidate power, have been able to, you know, win elections, form governments, and go on essentially, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, sacking the, the state? Well, the answer is very simple. These corrupt political parties function as instruments of the Guatemalan elites. They are the ones that have financed these political parties for many years. And it is that financing of corrupt political parties that was exposed by the Guatem by the Guatem what is known as the Guatemalan Commission Against Impunity, CSIG. CSIG, which, is, which was led by Ivan Velasquez, the current Minister of Defense in Colombia. CSIG was this UN-appointed commission in Guatemala which was established uh, after the signing of the peace agreements in 1996, a few years after that, with the sole purpose of investigating and dismantling clandestine you know, bodies of corruption. In 2015, CICIG, C -I -C -I -G, put out a report in Guatemala, which effectively and very clearly identified how and by what mechanisms and exactly in what ways and even in terms of what quantities the Guatemalan elites, I'm talking the private sector, I'm talking CACIF, this is the organized private sector in Guatemala, have been financing and co-opting and buying polit politicians, you know, especially mainly from the right-wing political parties, but also from some of the center political parties like the UNE party, which is the party now contesting the elections on August the 20th. So these parties have been able to secure their power, stay in power, form governments, and engage in massive scandals of corruption because, simply speaking, they enjoy the backing of the Guatemalan economic elites organized around the CACIF uh, uh, corporate group. That's the, that's the fundamental answer. And the reason why Semilla is so important and significant for a lot of people, especially young people, people who went to the streets in Guatemala in 2015 and effectively overthrew one of the most corrupt regimes in the history of the country, this party has been able to put itself where it is, not because they're getting money from the private sector, corporations, international backers, famous accusation always lobbed at the left in Guatemala that, you know, that, that Soros is founding them and, <laughs> and, you know, and so on. These sorts of things. All of this has not taken place here. These guys have done something in Guatemala that in the U.S. we, we, we can compare to the way kind of, a little bit, the way in which the Obama presidential campaign started way before 2008. That is to say, tapping grassroots movements, small donors. We're talking about, you know, uh, we're talking about a, a campaign by the penny, mm. you know, raising five cents here, 10 cents there, a buck here, a buck there. This is how they've done it. Arevalo was driving his own car during the entire election campaign, kind of like Pepe Mujica did in Uruguay, you know, uh, uh, way back when, when he was elected president uh, 15 years ago. So, that's the difference between these parties. Semilla really embodies the hopes and the aspirations and the goals of many young people who went to the streets in 2015 to overthrow a regime of corruption. And that is making all of that roster of political corrupt political parties, as well as the economic elites of the country, tremble. They are afraid. Well, they're so afraid that it seems as uh, as soon uh, I guess yesterday this broke that uh, the attorney general has seemingly suspended the Semia party um, and 
ahead of the elections on August 20th. I know that they had banned multiple parties from participating in this in the in the election that just happened um, before this even uh, before the surprise uh, victory or or I guess uh, the 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 12 percent threshold was reached by Arevalo and they were able to go to the to a runoff. Um, just just talk about this past uh, calendar year of banning political parties and how that informs what they're trying to do right now, now that the, the second election is happening in, in a few weeks. Sure. Um, it, it's no secret that uh, the what is called the Pact of the Corrupt, and, and obviously alliance with all of these state institutions, particularly the public ministry, have been orchestrating a campaign of you know, of, of disqualifications of any political party that, that's, that's a rival political party, a p- potentially a dangerous political party, uh, potentially a successful political party. They've been discounting them, disqualifying them, canceling them over the last year. They began with the disqualification of a, of a political party known as the MLP, the Movement for the Liberation of the People, and whose candidates were an indigenous woman, Telma Cabrera, and the former um, human, human rights ombudsman of the country, Jordan Rodas. Um, they were disqualified way back in February of, of this year. And they were disqualified on the basis of trumped up charges. They created a bogus case against the vice presidential candidate, Jordan Rodas. And based on that bogus case, the Supreme Electoral Tribunal denied them uh, the, 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 you know, the, the possibility of participating in the elections. They did the same with two other political parties of the right. One was a true outsider, Carlos Pineda, who was running for a party known as Citizen Prosperity. This guy was kind of a populist politician, but very much anti-establishment with, with a kind of a discourse of anti-corruption and so on. The guy is a, you know, a successful businessman, very wealthy and so on, sort of going out on the campaign trail saying, you know, I don't need to steal from anybody. I mean, I'm going to go in there and clean the swamp, sounding a bit like Trump. <laughs> and the guy is a right wing politician for sure. But, right. that, but I have the money. And so you, I can't be corrupt. Which you can makes, buy me. Makes no sense. Right. You yeah, can okay. buy me. Not only that, I got my own plane. I got my own bus. Yeah. I got my own resources. You're not going to buy me. And that didn't rhyme well with the, the, the established political parties, not to mention, of course, the uh, economic elites. So. Out he was. And then the third guy, this, the, the, you know, uh, uh, Roberto Arzu, the son of former presidential president of Guatemala, Alvaro Arzu, who was also running in this campaign for another political party, which was also disqualified almost for the same reasons. In other words, he was, he's, he's, been, he's been so alienated from the political elites in Guatemala that he was also talking anti-corruption from a right-wing perspective, but nonetheless anti-corruption. So they got rid of all of these people, all of them out of the election. So all of this led everybody to think that what we are talking about here is the orchestration, the, the fixing essentially of a fraud, of a political fraud. And what they managed to do quite successfully, I have to say, is essentially put their favorite candidates in the top three positions that were announced by all kinds of public opinion polls as the likely winners of the elections. You can imagine what's going to happen when on election day, June 25th, all election polls turned out to be wrong. And one of the guys that was least suspected of being able to make it through, actually did make it through. And that's the reason also why they didn't disqualify Semilla to begin with, because they posed no danger. They underestimated them. Yeah, they they underestimated them. Completely underestimated them, completely disqualified them offhand. But now that they've made through, now that they've done all kinds of tricks to try and derail the election, to try to derail the results, what happened today is unbelievable. They went, the public, the attorney general's office, the public ministry in Guatemala went to Semilla's own headquarters in Guatemala City, right, to raid it, to grab the files of the party on the basis of, again, another Trump top charge against the party, claiming that the party has 
has forged about 5,000 signatures and that each each of those forged signatures is, a, is worth about seven, seven local quetzales, which is the currency of Guatemala. And, and in total, we're talking about like, you know, 170,000 quetzales and that this constitutes money laundering. So they've trumped up all sorts of crazy charges against uh, Semilla. And on those basis, they've suspended the party from continuing to participate in the process. And they have also suspended the possibility of officializing results and candidacies of the party, including Arevalo's own candidacy, which means the whole process is, as we speak, in danger of being completely derailed. This and so is that, incredible. That, that's a crisis, right? I mean, that is, that is, so at like where, first of all, you know, this is kind of my last question, so I'll make it as big as possible, right? Um, but like, how is, turnout going to affect this because i know there was very low turnout and there has been because people are basically dejected they don't know what they can uh how to make a difference essentially because of all this corruption and two i mean is it possible that Semia uh is basically barred from participating in the runoff in, in on the 20th i mean like this could be cataclysmic and then that means people are taken to the streets and being very angry understandably so it is possible that they can take this to the last consequences and derail the entire process. I mean, they are so enraged and they are so scared that at this point they're willing to commit what I like to call democraticide. They're willing to kill it all if that means not allowing Arevalo to get into power. Now, Arevalo has said in this morning's press conference that they are not going to recognize these kinds of things that they're doing. These kinds of things that they're doing are blatantly illegal. They're literally violating the law, not only the constitution, but also the election law in the country that explicitly, explicitly uh, uh, sort of bars the possibility of canceling a political party once the process has begun, once the elections have taken place, not to mention once we are moving to the second run of elections on August the 20th. However, again, we're up against a regime of impunity and corruption and co-optation. These guys can do anything and they are infamous for, you know, for going as low as they possibly can with no moral scruples to do it. So what is the way forward? I think, and Semilla has made it very clear, they're going to go on campaigning regardless. They're not going to, they're not going to bow down to this. They're, they're themselves submitting appeals to the constitutional court, the highest court, to invalidate the shenanigans. And on top of that, they're calling on the people to go out on the streets, to do so peacefully, but to demonstrate with the power of the voice and the power of our bodies that this democracy, however eroded, cannot be stolen. So listen, the people have now to you know, exercise their, 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 their power to destitute this, to, to, to remove this, this, this corrupt authorities. It's up to, I think it's more than up to Zemia, it's up to Guatemalan citizens to stop this from happening. Well, um, we hopefully we can have you on again uh, ahead of or after the 20th, just to, if you'd like, um, just to, to check back in because we'll this be is- glad to. I mean, uh, uh, Guatemala is, the, is Central America's most populous country. And this is an enormously important moment. So, um, Marco, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Where can people check out some of your writing and your work? Uh, I blog at a, at a place called Refundacion Ya. It's um, refundacionya.net. Okay. Um, I also blog at uh, Substack, Refundacion Ya. And I also tweet a lot. All right, great. Well, uh, we'll put a link to that kind of stuff in the description wherever you're listening to this great. Um, or watching. Really appreciate uh, your time today, Marco. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, guys, with that, we're going to wrap up the first hour of this program. I mean, I don't, I don't always toot this show's on horn, but like those were two excellent interviews. Those were two very good interviews. Um, and I hope people were more a little bit more informed about the world after that. Um, so good job, John and Bradley, for booking booking these people. Great stuff. Um, and a big thanks to um, um, a friend of the show and former guest David Adler, 
who um, helped us find uh, help. Oh, us, he uh, did. Re- re- recommended Marco. That uh, makes so, sense. Yeah, there you go. Another great. That makes sense. Great, why he uh, was so good. Absolutely, another great foreign policy guest about Latin America and South America. So. Um. All right. Well, with that, guys, yeah, we're wrapping up the first hour again. The number is six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. We'll take some calls on the phone, huh? Um, and we'll also read your IMs. Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, yeah, Left Reckoning. I had a really fun uh, night with uh, Anders Lee talking about the Minnesota farmer labor movement in the uh, first half of the uh, uh, Left Reckoning on Tuesday night. And then for the post game, which the VOD is up publicly for everybody on Twitch, a little birdie told me. Mm-hmm. Um, but for members uh, at Patreon.com, it's Left Reckoning. I watched two documentaries about Henry Martinson, who is this... At the time of the documentaries, which were made in 1978 and, or 19 to 1980, he was about a 100-year-old socialist in North Dakota who was there in the 19-teens when mm. he was a, a socialist magazine editor, and they realized socialism wasn't really appealing to the farmers, so they moved to this nonpartisan league, mm. farmer populism, and uh, he saw all of that, including the... Uh, the red scare, both red scares, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and sort of the um, the the way the nonpartisan league uh, influenced and inspired the farmer labor movement in Minnesota. So, um, patreon.com slash left reckoning to get access to that. And I think I'm going to watch uh, another movie on the uh, Twitch feed. So pe- people should go uh, subscribe to the tw- Left Reckoning Twitch feed if they want more content like that. All right. Um, and on ESVN, we spoke about the New York Times shuttering its sports desk in favor of a non-unionized labor force with The Athletic. Um, we did talk about uh, the Northwestern hazing scandal before Pat F- Fitzgerald was fired later that day. So it's a tad outdated, but you can still get the information. Uh, and some NHL draft, uh, NBA free agency uh, kind of talk over there. We talked about the Debrinkat trade to Detroit, that kind of thing. Uh, YouTube.com slash ESVN show. And oh, there we go, like magic. Our, my friends, Matt Binder and Brandon Sutton, who I cannot hear. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, good. Um, that's, that's all that matters then. I mean, we've shadow banned Brandon. In the meantime, <laughs> as we figure that out, Binder, what's happening on the three shows you work on, like a busy man? Um, left record, I mean, uh, uh, leftist yeah, mafia. Left reckoning, you know yeah. me, left reckoning, uh, ESVN. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> doom scam economy. There you go. Right. Tee it up. Right. So on, uh, doom this past Tuesday, I had on, uh, Benny Carollo, formerly of TYT. And, you know, we spoke more broadly about, um, you know, what's going on to, uh, you know, trans people in this country right now and the, you know, the sort of white supremacy that really is the underlying factor of a lot of this. And then, of course, we, we uh, went from that broader, more important conversation. We talked about uh, what's been uh, also going on in progressive circles with a, a certain show. Uh, but definitely check it out. Been getting a lot of great reviews. Benny was fantastic on the show. Um, I think it's easily one of the best episodes I've done in the Jeez, wow. four or five years I've done Doom so far. Um, so up at youtube.com slash Matt Binder and also at doomedcast.com. New episode of Scam Economy on the way probably next week. Uh, tonight, uh, Leftist Mafia. Definitely check out tonight's episode. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's all from me right now. All right. Um, you're back, Brandon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Just in time for you to uh, plug perfect. the discourse. Just in time for me to plug the discourse. So uh, you can catch discourse on patreon.com backslash expanded discourse or soundcloud.com backslash expanded discourse. We should have a new episode for you up sometime this weekend. All right. Beautiful. Um, sounds good. Narrator says uh, Matt's Benny interview really was incredible. So there you go. Oh, um, I will you. check that out at some point too. Um, yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk uh, in the fun half. The number is again, 646-257-3920. We will read your IMs. We will do some fun clips. See you then. There. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back.
boy is back. And the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. And the alpha males are back. 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 Boy is back. And the alpha males are back. 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 Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back. Back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. 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 Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back. 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 You are a madman. And the alpha males are back. Back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a wow! What a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. Bring back DJ Denner. Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like forty-five seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. You see, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? What 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 what